Westfield Memorial Hospital provides high-quality health care to residents of Western New York, offering patients the most sophisticated medical advancements while keeping the ease and familiarity of a community hospital. Support for Chautauqua Sunrise has been provided by WRFA 107.9 FM, Jamestown's public radio station, streaming online 24-7 at WRFALP.com. Low power to the people. Chautauqua Sunrise is made possible by a grant from Fredonia Place, a continuing care retirement community providing dignity in a modern luxury environment. Meter's Restaurant, a family tradition for over 50 years in downtown Ripley, is a proud supporter of Chautauqua Sunrise. Meter's provides all-day dining, banquet services, and custom catering, specializing in pie. Funding for Chautauqua Sunrise is provided in part by the Chautauqua County Industrial Development Agency with offices in Jamestown, Dunkirk, and Westfield, helping businesses to prosper throughout Chautauqua County. From supporting people with disabilities to enjoy great lives to providing health care services that are available to anyone, the Resource Center has been improving our county for more than 60 years. Learn more about how the Resource Center makes a positive difference in people's lives. From the Access Chautauqua Studios in Mayville, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Chautauqua Sunrise is hosted by Doc Hamels and supported by the award-winning volunteers at Access Chautauqua. We are here to share local news, colorful interviews, and events of interest to everyone. Chautauqua Sunrise is broadcast live Saturday mornings each week from 9 to 10 a.m. Send events via email or call us live. Check us out on YouTube and Facebook. And now, from the Access Chautauqua Studios, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Chautauqua Sunrise. Yowza! Minus three here in the county seat in Mayville. I couldn't believe it. Over in uh, Ripley, we're in a balmy six. <laughs> wow. Well... The sun's shining, though. Oh, I have to give credit to Jamestown. I, evidently, you win. You, you said you were minus eight this morning? Yeah. Whoa, macro frozen pipe city. Yo. Well, anyways, it's, it's in the uh, middle of, uh, getting towards the end of January. We're supposed to be this cold, I guess. They tell me it's good because it kills all the insects that we don't want to see in the spring. So, okay, I'm good with that. And also, supposedly, it sends all the pl plants and trees into dormancy, and that makes for good buds in the spring as well. So. Breeze away. Whew. Gosh. But it's a beautiful morning out there. It's really, it's, it's pretty. It's, these uh, mornings have been a beautiful sunshine. Last night, the moon was shining, and you can see the stars. It was just, just beautiful. I want to say, of course, good morning to all of you, wherever you are, and good afternoon, wherever you are. And, of course, good afternoon for all of my listeners on WRFA 107.9. Low power to the people in Jamestown. Thanks for joining us. Um... I want, to, I want to say something up front for those of you who are going to be watching listening to this show. This is going to be a very mature topic, and we're going to be talking about some rather sensitive things, and uh, well, you know how we are here, how I roll. We talk about whatever we have to talk about as it pertains to Chautauqua County. So we're going to be talking about uh, human trafficking, okay? I'm letting you know right now, this is going to be uh, a pretty heavy, dark topic, and uh, if that means moving people in and out of the room, that's up to you. But I'm letting you know up front, okay? Because of this topic, you always know that you can call in and ask questions. All right, you don't have to identify yourself or anything like that. You know how it goes. 716-753-5225, and you can ask a question. You know what they always say, the, the worst question in the world is the one that's not asked, okay? So if you have a, a concern or you want more information during the show, please call. Always remember, too, <clears throat> that if you are watching the show later on in the week, because we, you know we are on Spectrum 1301 at 2 and 8 every day, um, you can go and watch it then. 
or you can go to YouTube. We post the show there forever and ever and ever because you may want a phone number. You say, what did she say about whatever? Uh, what's the address? Okay, that information, we're like a library of, of, of good stuff that you should be able to, to uh, dig into anytime you need to, okay? Oh, I'm gonna do a, a funny little announcement and I'm doing this for a new friend of mine. <clears throat> Her name is Sumi Kim, Kim and uh, she lives over in Connecticut and she's been re doing research in my hometown of Ripley. And so I'm putting out a little blurb for her. So, uh, Sumi, if you watch this, you're gonna kick out of this. She's doing research, research on her Swedish family that came to Jamestown area in about 1864, somewhere in that range. And her great, great, great grandfather's name was Andrew Johnson, but we're trying to find information about him. And his son was Alfred B. Johnson, who eventually came to Ripley and was a blacksmith for like a bazillion years and passed away in 1943. So I'm the town historian, so I, I made a promise to myself that I'd throw that out there because we're just trying to do a little deeper research on that. So Sumi, hopefully we, we get some answers for you. What about the Buffalo Bills, Randall? He was giving us a hard time last week. Bazoom! Perfect offensive game. Never before. Awesome, that's all I can say. You know, people say, why do you root for the Buffalo Bills? Well, <laughs> when you're born in a city, sometimes you don't have too much choice. Of course, you have choices. There's no, no team in Jamestown. But I was born in uh, Buffalo, and so you just it's part of your DNA, I guess. All right. Anyways, I uh, wish them good luck tomorrow. Coming up, under announcements, I can't hear you. <laughs> He's giving me grief over here. Uh, coming up, February 5th. <laughs> Let's go to that slide, Jeff, on the on the uh, Dementia Conference. We had a show last week. Folks were here from uh, various organizations, from the Office of the Aging Services, the YWCA in Westfield, the Westfield Mabel Rotary Club, and from Alzheimer's Organization or Association from Western New York. Okay, February 5, folks, there is a free conference from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the Williams Center. And we talked about the fact that many people have someone in their lives that are struggling with dementia, Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, you name it, whatever. This is a workshop for you to gain more insight into the, into the syndrome, to gain some skills to help them. There's gonna be first aid provided in the event that they are struggling with some kind of a health issue and they need first aid. And to, to do this, to, to participate, it's real easy. You contact the YWCA. If you're watching TV right now, you can see at the bottom of the screen, it's what, screen, excuse me, ywcawestfield.org backslash conference, or you can give them a call at the uh, YWCA. I'm gonna refer back to my notes from last week real quick. And the number there is 326-2011. All right, 326-2011, and you can register for that. I'm told they need 15 uh, people for the conference, and they're at 14 as of this morning. So they're filling up quick, and I know they're gonna have enough seats for 24 people. So please, if this is of any interest or concern to you, jump on it, because it's gonna be awesome, I'm told. All right, so we're gonna go to our other announcements, and always remember, during the show, you can call in uh, your community event, whether it's a fundraiser or, a, like in this case, a conference. It could be somebody's anniversary or birthday, whatever. We want to hear from you. Mike from Portland, happy birthday. He watches the show all the time and calls in. He just had his birthday the other day. All right, let me put my glasses on, and here we go. Let's go to slide 15, Jeff. <clears throat> my, my TV voice down here is crackling on me already. <clears throat> Infinity Visual and Performing Arts welcomes two new members to their board of directors. Sunny Tan Amy is a Haitian poet, essayist, and translator. He is the Michael Rudell Director of Literary Arts of Chita at Chautauqua Institution. In addition to his chap book, La Woman, Iron Works Press 2019, he is the author of the Haitian Creole translation of the book, Olympic hero, the Lennox Kilgore's story. He is also <clears throat> with the Haitian scholars putting together a Haitian Creole course in dual lingo. You know, this is a challenge for me every Saturday morning to read these things. <laughs> I never know what I'm gonna have to say. I think I said that all correctly. 
His works have appeared or are forthcoming in Brainchild, Luna Negra, La Vista Ping Pong, The Oakland Review, Dunes Review, Poets.org, Hunger Mountain Review, and Cleveland Review of Books. Among others, he's earned his BBA degree in accounting. Upon graduation, he went to Haiti excuse me, and worked as staff accountant at Institution Univers. Then, as the accounting supervisor at Citadel Manufacturing, SA at Sony, has always been involved in the arts, from being a member of a youth troupe that toured the northern regions of Haiti and Dominican Republic, and becoming the editor of his high school's literary magazine, uh, I'm not going to even try to pronounce it, uh, to co-founding the literary uh, journal that publishes the works of incarcerated people, called ID13. Now, as part of his work at Chautauqua Institution, Sonny has become involved in the Chautauqua County community through projects like Holidays in Poetry, uh, a project that highlights the poems of students, and Sonny lives in Westfield, New York. Oh, I'll have to check him out. All right, Michaela Santiago Froebel as the other individual, having just over eight years of experience working in arts and cultural institutions, Michaela serves as the arts marketing specialist for Chautauqua Institution's opera and theater companies. Wow. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Business and a concentration in Music Business and a Bachelor of Arts in Arts Administration with concentration in Communication from the State University of Fredonia. She also holds a Master of Science in Communication and Leadership, Nonprofit Organizational Behavior from Canisius College. In addition, she holds the, the Diversity and Inclusion Certification from Cornell University and is excited to infuse all she has learned into decision-making and communication strategies. With a passion for lifting the voices of those often left unheard, Michaela founded the Chatty Carmen's podcast in 2020. Sounds like fun. With a simple vision, the female identifying change makers of color deserve platforms to share their lives. Originally from the Bronx, she previously worked at Chautauqua with roles in dance and ticketing operations. In addition, her tenure includes communications and development experience from Mark Morris Dance Group in Brooklyn, New York, Center for Elder Law and Justice, Frank Lloyd Wright's The Martin House. That was just down the street from my, uh, my parents' house. Kinesis College, Chautauqua Regional Youth Ballet, and serving as house manager and ticketing agent for uh, SUNY Fredonia's Rockefeller Centers. Center. She is currently serving as a board member for the Create Change uh, project in Dunkirk. Michaela lives in Fredonia with her spouse Eric and their sheep -a doodle Paxton. I can tell you about sheep -a doodles, but I don't have time. Infinity Board of uh, Directors is comprised of 11 members, including a whole bunch of people that I'm not going to mention right now. But uh, you all know what Infinity is. It's a, a music and arts education performing center for kids, for adults, private lessons, group classes. And if you want to know more information, give them a call at 664-0991. <coughs> Moving right along. Public input being sought for the Mayville Strategic Waterfront <clears throat> Activation Effort. Okay, we have a slide for that, I believe. Okay, the folks are uh, from the Mayville area are being invited as stakeholders. We got a phone call already. Hold the phone. All right, good morning, caller. Oh, good morning, Doc. It's, it's Mike Felsman calling. The birthday boy! Uh, how, thank you for the birthday wishes. You're welcome. How are you? I am good. See, people do you? watch the show. <laughs> I do, I did. I have it on this morning, and uh, I, I heard you mention my birthday, and I hadn't even thought a whole lot about it, but, uh, uh, you know, you would, you would mention it. So yeah. well, thank you. Thank you for the shout-out. You're, you're welcome. Um, so what's your temperature up there in uh, Portland? Uh, I think it's around 15. What? Already? I think so. I don't know. I have a thermometer on the front of my house. I don't know how accurate it is. I did we're, look. We're minus three here in Mayville. I heard you say that. Woo. I heard you say that. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I, I think we could be 15. I mean, with, with the, the sun light, shining, yeah. You know, and everything. Okay, super. So, well, yeah. I hope you had a good birthday, Mike. I did. I did. All right. I'll let you get on with the show. Okay, well, thanks for calling in. See you. Right, you're welcome. We'll see you. Very good. Well, folks, that's how simple it is. We'd love to hear from our viewers. Hey, listeners. Okay, so 
The, the, the folks in Mayville are looking for input uh, regarding this topic. So let me read. The village of Mayville's Lakeside Park is a community resource with cultural, recreational, and scenic value. The historic train depot, boat launch, beach, floating stage, and other amenities have established Lakeside Park as a local and regional asset. However, park facilities have uh, degraded over time, and some of the properties surrounding the park are underutilized. In addition, more amenities could be added to the park, thereby improving its use. With the recent approval of the Lodge Project, which is a 34-unit condominium resort adjacent to, to the park, there is a growing need to access, access, whew, access Lakeside Park and the West Lake Road Route 394 corridor and identify necessary opportune improvements. The intent of this effort is to understand the existing conditions within and surrounding Lakeside Park and so forth and collecting opinions. So, they are going to have a meeting on February 25th. So, right now, uh, this is your opportunity to, to have some input. So, uh, I would recommend that you get a hold of your mayor, Ken Shearer, or Rebecca Worcester, who is part of the planning department for the county, and let them know what you think, okay? So let's move on uh, to the next page here. Some things are going on this weekend. Snow, today, so snowmobile drag race at Cocaine uh, Resort, drag race, snowmobile. All right, and when we're in Cherry Creek, this event is hosted by Cocaine Resort, and. Uh, full power performance. The event is weather dependent with gates opening at 8.30. It's starting right now, so check it out. Also, family fun day from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the camp at Finley, uh, at Finley, it says. In Climber, New York, bring your own equipment and come enjoy sledding, ice fishing, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, and a whole lot more. If you're interested, give them a call at 769-7146. And coming up, on February 5, which is not very far away, the 13th annual Kick Cabin Fever Indoor Triathlon. Let me say that again, that sounds like fun. The annual Kick Cabin Fever Indoor Triathlon. It's going to be at 9 a.m. at the Chautauqua Health and Fitness Center in the Turner Community Center, right here in, just down the road in Chautauqua. Get a break from our cold winter months and get moving by participating in this fun indoor triathlon where the events can include swimming, biking, and running. Uh, only lasts for a total of 45 minutes. The cost is $35 per person, $75 per team, and up three, and the proceeds go, let's say proceeds from the event stay in Chautauqua County to assist, assist with suicide prevention efforts. So, a good cause. If you want to know more information, 753-4522. Okay, the next one is a mouthful. I'll get through it the best I can. Whew! This is happening at... The Reg, Reg Linnae Center. <clears throat> the Birdhouse Factory, part of the Circa Mechanics. Friday, January 28th, 7.30 to 9.30. Okay, let's see here. Masks are required regardless of vaccination status. Admission requirements are subject to change. I'm not sure what they mean by that. <clears throat> Probably with the masks and things. From the creators of... Pedal Punk and 42 FT. Don't know what that is. A place where spectators will watch a contortionist perform on a turntable powered by unicyclists. They will be captiv captivated by the trapeze artist flying high thanks to the spins of an acrobat inside a giant gear-like wheel. I'm trying to picture this. And they will be stunned when the trampoline wall artists defy the laws of physics by virtually flying and walking on air. Holy moly. All the while, they will be giggling at the antics of the com comedic, comedic characters. This is a tough one. Impressed by the acro dancing and enchanted by the story of laughter, love, flight, and birdhouses. Birdhouse Factory was inspired in part by the masterful industry murals of Mexican-born artist Diego Rivera, the outrageous illustrations of cartoonist Rube Goldberg, and the slapstick-style humor of Charlie Chaplin's film, Modern Times. While its inspirations make Birdhouse Factory artful, nostalgic, and funny, the true essence of the show comes from the circus. Woo. All right, so we're gonna leave that, and we took care of that one, and oh, so 
that particular show is $50 for adults, $40, oh, $50 if you're in the premium seats, $40 for regular seats, $20 for children, 12 and under, and let's see, and then, and under 12 or $10, you have to read this, okay? So, and then also coming up, West Side Story, that's going to be uh, shown on January 29th, 8 to 10.30 p.m. The doors open at 7, and the tickets are usually $7. It doesn't say here. And then uh, you can go to the, the, the uh, box office Mondays and Fridays, 12 to 5 p.m., Wednesdays, 12 to 8, uh, 8 p.m. For tickets, give them a call at 484-7070. Ask them what the price is because it doesn't say. Sounds like uh, a great film. But it's gotten really good reviews. All right. Now, <clears throat> because it's so cold out, I got this note, City of Jamestown reminds residents, and this is all Chautauqua County, to be careful today, tomorrow, throughout the week, and uh, with temperatures dipping from 0 to negative 10 and wind chill factor negative 15 degrees. While we deal with cold temperatures and frequently do not understand the effects that extreme uh, cold can have on the body, which can generate a significant decrease decrease in body temperature and induce frostbite, damage to exposed skin and other tissue over an accelerated period of time. Make sure to wear layers and if you go outside, let someone know that you're leaving and when you uh, make, it, you're, make it to your destination. Okay, so that's just a word to the wise. And just two quick ones. Uh, doors open Jamestown has been changed. We announced a certain date originally and now it's uh, March 5. I just want you to mark your calendars for that. And if you're interested in the Mayville Winter Festival, you're still looking for sponsors and volunteers. And that's going to be held in a few weeks from now, uh, February 18th through the 20th. Okay, that's all I got right now. Stay tuned. We're going to have a little break, and we'll be right back. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Well, that looked like a home video at my house. <laughs> I like to cook. Sometimes things don't work out so well. All right. So adopting is definitely an option out there in our, in our uh, community. So uh, you can look into that if you are interested. All right. Now to the topic at hand. I have had Diana Butcher on the show from the Salvation Army in a new center, and we've talked about some pretty, pretty tough topics. Uh, sexual assault, sexual abuse, domestic violence, and so forth. And, <clears throat> you know, it's really easy, folks, to just say, eh, it's not my problem, it, it's, it's over in that area of the county. Or, we don't have those issues here in Chautauqua County. Folks, we do. <coughs> we do. And uh, Diana had recommended that I have my guest on today. And so this is my first time approaching this topic. I've watched it on TV, in references to it. It's been in the news with the whole, um, uh, was it Giselle Maxwell and all that business, the Brian Epstein or Epstein uh, disaster. It's just horrible, horrible. Uh, so I want to welcome to the show, nonetheless, because we're going to talk about some heavy stuff. Get this right, Kaylee Fazer and uh, Karen Yaversky. <laughs> Good morning, ladies. Good morning. How's that for an intro? Great job. So far, so yeah. good. All right. Awesome. Um, I'm not going to pretend I'm a, that I'm an expert on any of this. All I know is that it's been very troubling to me personally when I have heard and talked to law enforcement and various individuals <clears throat> that this is happening in our county. All right. So let's start with you, Kaylee. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved on this topic. Sure. So as you said, my name is Kaylee Fazer. Um, I'm a resident of Chautauqua County. I was born and raised here, graduated from Dunkirk High School in 2006, and then um, left the area for a, a bit and lived in um, other parts of Western New York and Central New York where um, you know, I got my um, undergraduate degree in <laughs> tourism and recreation management, which is, has nothing to do with human trafficking, um, but led me to, um, interestingly enough, work in healthcare. Um, I worked for some healthcare companies throughout um, Central and Western New York where I did a lot of marketing and sales and then eventually started working more in um, case management and social work and decided to go back to school 
to get my master's in social work and that led me back to Chautauqua County. In 2016, I moved back here and was doing my field work for my graduate program with um, Chautauqua County's Department of Health and Human Services. I worked directly with Leanna Luca Conley, and that was um, the onset of the Safe Harbor program that we're going to talk about today. Um, so, started learning about trafficking here in Chautauqua County, and while I didn't immediately get involved in this project, um, my interests and passions took me more towards the field of elder abuse. I was working with older adults um, and and started a multidisciplinary team here in Chautauqua County to, um, to address complex cases of elder abuse. But nonetheless, that eventually led me back here to um, the trafficking world. I've always um, had a passion for young people and working with youth. I'm a lifelong volunteer with the Girl Scouts. Um, I, there's a Girl Scout troop in Dunkirk, Fredonia that I um, was in as a child mm -hmm. and continue to volunteer well, with. Good for you. Um, and, and yeah, it's just throughout my life, I've always been, um, you know, wanting to work with and serve youth in my community and, and help them grow and change. So the child advocacy program is, is such a, a wonderful part of our community. And as we'll talk about Safe Harbor moving into that, it just seems like, you know, the right path for me. So that's my well, thank long winded introduction. Thank you for all that you do. <coughs> I was involved with uh, Boy Scouts for over 20, <coughs> excuse me, 25 years myself. So I, I know all the good work they do. And we've had the Girl Scouts out here in the past. Okay. And Karen, you and I know each other from, from a different time, yes, but welcome to the show. How about, uh, tell us a little bit about how you were involved with the program today. Yeah, well my uh, path is a little different than Kaylee's, <coughs> although interestingly my college degree is in recreation and parks as well. I don't know how that uh, applied to uh, get me here, but um, I worked for about 30 years in Christian camp and uh, retreat ministries, first in Wisconsin for 12 years and then returning back to this area. I grew up in Warren County. Uh, but I uh, have lived in Chautauqua County now for close to 30 years. I uh, was a camp director at Camp Mission Meadows and at some point decided I needed to do something different and through a variety of ways, including working part-time at the Salvation Army News Center, found my way to the Child Advocacy Program and the Safe Harbor Program is now housed at the Child Advocacy Program. So uh, as of the 1st of 2022, I am working um, still at CAP, but uh, part-time with Kaylee in the safe harbor. So you've been on the job 22 days or whatever. Exactly, Thursday. something like that, yes. yes. Although 22. even prior to the safe harbor program <coughs> started before it came to CAP, it was under right. the uh, YWCA umbrella. Okay. And I was kind of the person at CAP who was closely linked there and, and the point person at CAP already. So I've been working some with the concerns of kids who are sexually exploited or potentially trafficked. In okay. Chautauqua County for a couple of years. All right. Mm -hmm. I gave the uh, folks fair warning that we're going to talk about some heavy duty stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the thought of anybody messing with my kids just blows me mm -hmm. away. I mean, I'd be like a bear. You know, I just, no rock would be unturned. I would find some way to get to that person. <sighs> Human trafficking, let's define it. So simply put, human trafficking is modern day slavery. It's a commodification of human life, or in other words, it's taking advantage of someone for sex or labor um, and for your own benefit. Um, you know, so to kind of give a backstory, um, when we talk about trafficking, it's important to kind of look at our legal definitions of what that means, because it's so important yep. here. Um, so taking a step back 22 years ago in the year 2000, um, federal legislation was passed in our country, which changed the way that we see youth engaged in commercial sex. Um, so what does that even mean? So I'm going to read you two, or actually, can we put those slides up? Um, slide, I think the second one that sure. I shared with you, um, where we have our legal definitions of sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and these come directly from that federal law, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of the year 2000. All right, there we go. So that, that <coughs> states that sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act, in which the commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. And then we also have labor trafficking, which is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion, for the purposes of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. So those are really heavy, heavy definitions, um, you know, very legalese, I guess. Um, but what does that even mean? To kind of break that down, 
What's so important about this federal legislation is that for the first time in our country, it's stated that a youth who's engaged in commercial sex, which I'll define in just a moment, who's under the age of 18 cannot legally consent to that sexual act. So by definition of this federal legislation, if a child or a minor under the age of 18 is engaged in a commercial sex act, they are, they're being victimized. They cannot legally consent to that. So what exactly is commercial sex? Um, commercial sex, it, it refers to a range of crimes and activities that involve the, the sexual act um, or sexual abuse or exploitation of a child for the financial benefit of another person or in exchange of anything of value, including monetary or non-monetary benefits. So it could be drugs, money, um, clothing, a place to live or sleep, um, given or received by any person. And when we talk about the commercial sexual exploitation of children, we use the, the acronym CSEC. So I'm gonna use that for, so I don't have to give this mouthful all the time. So CSEC is the commercial, exploita the commercial sexual exploitation of children. And that um, we like to think of is, is kind of, actually stepping back even more, if you think of child sexual abuse, so we've talked about the child advocacy program, um, haven't gotten too much into de detail about that, but um, vaguely or broadly, the, the child advocacy program responds to cases of child sexual abuse in Chautauqua County. We coordinate a multidisciplinary response with several different stakeholders and partners in the community, and we come together to, um, to help these families move through that, um, that issue. So we have child sexual abuse as like an umbrella topic, right? And then underneath that, we have CSEC, or the Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children on the screen now. And then underneath CSEC, there's four different types of commercial sexual exploitation. So if we actually are going to start on the right side of the screen, we have stripping and dancing. I think we all know what that means. Um, survival sex. So survival sex is when somebody has sex basically for survival to meet their basic needs. Um, we've worked with uh, several children, several youth in Chautauqua County that have um, had to trade sex for their survival, whether that's for a place to sleep, maybe they've been kicked out of their homes, or they've run away from a traumatic or abusive situation and there's nowhere to stay. Perhaps they're couch surfing, meaning they're staying at you know, someone's house for a little while, but then that doesn't work out, so they're going to stay at somebody else's house, maybe they're on the streets. Um, research tells us that within 48 hours of a youth being unaccompanied on the street, they will be propositioned for commercial sex. So that is, that's kind of what survival sex is. Right. Having, yep. Okay, follow-up question, take a breath. Take a you, breath. you are really <laughs> moving right along on me. Gender. Gender. Males, females, yep. either way? Um, kids, folks of all genders, um, male, female, and non-binary. Um, research indicates, I mean, as with most interpersonal crimes, women, girls are more likely to identify it, um, that they're being victimized and more likely to report that crime. Um, so we do see, statistically, way more girls reporting, but anecdotally, in, in conversations with the survivors that we worked with, this is happening to youth of all genders. All right. So you are telling me, as we sit here today, someone under the age of 18, in order to be warm, not in sub-zero weather or whatever, they need someplace to eat and sleep. Mm -hmm they are offering themselves up for sex? Maybe not even offering themselves up for sex, but being in a position where they're desperate for a place to sleep, a place to live, and that adult is preying on them. That adult okay. is exploiting them to, saying, to meet their own you, needs. You, here's the deal. You can stay here, but... Absolutely. Right. Or you can stay here and all is well and good until a couple days later things change. Right, all right. Okay. Uh, there, was a, there was two more legs two on more. that chart. So can you bring that back up, Jeff? Okay, thank you. Um, after survival sex, we have child sexual abuse materials, or CSAM for short, and that's the new term for child pornography. Okay. Uh, I think we all know what child pornography is, and I, um, I like to give this little narrative about that. So in the 1980s, the U.S. did a really great job of hampering down on the production and distribution of child sexual abuse materials. It was a, a huge focus um, in our country, um, but in the 1990s, as we can imagine, with the advent of the Internet and um, the availability and access to file sharing, it just skyrocketed. Um, in 2020, which is, I was going to say last year, but now two years ago, mm -hmm. um, it was estimated that in the United States, just in the U.S., each day, 100,000 new images of child sexual abuse were uploaded to the Internet. So again, 100,000 new images right, let, each let day. Let me get this straight now. We're not talking about nudity. We are talking about pictures of somebody sexually abusing a minor. So uh, A picture of that on the screens. Yes, and, and nudity, too, because if you're showing a, a child under the age of 19 what or I mean, 18... What I'm getting at, it, it, this isn't 
this is the criminal behavior. Yes. There's 100,000 yes. shots of this. All right, bring it to, to the Chautauqua County. Is that happening here in the county? It certainly is happening here in the county. Right. Um, I would mm -hmm. say, you know, for all of you watching or listening, a quick Google search in the Post Journal of the Observer, or Observer will lead you to some specific cases um, that have happened here in the county. Not necessarily all involved with our work, but, right. you know, happening. Um, and in the work that we do day to day with survivors, we are seeing a lot of these internet based crimes and a lot of this, um, the child sexual abuse materials being shared, whether that's adults um, producing and distributing this material of children or, or peer on peer of other youth um, doing that. To okay, I, I remember a case about two years ago, and I'm not going to go into it. Somebody that was like, everybody was in shock that this was happening. They were they had, on their computer at home, had a lot of pornography and, mm -hmm. and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But they weren't producing it, they were just sharing it. Is that what you're saying? Are people producing th this type of thing here in Chautauqua County? Yes. <sighs> and really, the, that's probably the most common thing is home generated um, photos and things uh, for those who would abuse children. And um, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, most commonly, it is, you know, where somebody is is um, exploiting or abusing a child, they may also be taking pictures. And uh, again, like Kaylee said, with the internet, it is just so easy to yeah, share photos. And, for sure. Um, and trade photos, and you know, that's uh, what. Okay. Mm -hmm. Last leg of the, of the chart. And then we have, lastly, is sex trafficking. Um, so we talked about trafficking in general, but it always gets a little confusing because by definition, that falls under commercial sex, right? So sex trafficking is a little bit different than those other forms of commercial sexual exploitation that we discussed, and that trafficking always involves three parties. With trafficking, you always have the trafficker or the exploiter that's orchestrating this ex exchange of sex for money and is benefiting financially. So you have the trafficker. It's like a, almost like a pimp. A pimp, it is a pimp. Mm -hmm. And then you have the John or the buyer, the person that's purchasing the sex. And then you have the victim or the provider, the child, the minor that is being used for sex in that exchange. All right, I'm, I'm going to ask you every time. Is that happening in Chicago? Sure is. Oh, and man. again, you know, Google search that too for some articles um, about some recent trafficking um, instances here. You know, and, and I don't know if this is accurate, but I know this that I've been told over the years that the throughway is the artery for all evil drugs, sex trafficking, alcohol, whatever. Is that, am I right? So, you know, we, I hear that too. I've heard that my whole life, that right here in, in this spot in New York, where, you know, we've got Pennsylvania, we've got downstate, we've got Canada so close, right? But I think that brings up a lot of the myths and misconceptions around what trafficking and, and commercial sexual exploitation actually are. Um, we, our minds tend to go to actually like transporting people b to different places for sex. And that's not necessarily, that doesn't have to happen for trafficking to happen. It's not part of that federal definition. Um, somebody doesn't need to be moved between borders um, or communities. People are trafficked right in their own homes. Oftentimes they're trafficked by family members or other trusted adults. Um, and it's, it's what we see what, here in rural Chautauqua County is that it's happening in one's community, in one's neighborhood. There are instances where people are moved perhaps to Buffalo or to Erie or throughout Chautauqua County, Cattaraugus County, whatnot. Um, but I would say that the majority of cases that we are involved in are happening here um, in someone's community. What I, what I, Carrie, maybe you can shine mm -hmm. a little light on this mm -hmm. one. Um, I'm going to bounce between the two of you. Yeah. Um, sometimes sometimes we, we have a phone call, but I'm going to hold up just one second, caller, um, about kids that leave home, they're snatched up somehow, get caught up in this ring of sex trafficking, and they're they're moved out of out of country mm -hmm. is that happening around here we don't see that so much like Kaylee said they might be moved um, to Buffalo just temporarily motel parties mm -hmm. or those kinds of things um, we've had kids who have been shuttled around a little bit but most often it's like Kaylee said really happening right here mm -hmm. so when we think about trafficking and that was I told you we were gonna ask you a question and that was mm -hmm when you think of the term human trafficking, what do we think of? Mm -hmm. And probably most people would say, looking at you know panel vans where kids are in there chained to something and hauled off to somewhere. Um, that may happen, but it's pretty rare. It's not what we're seeing. It's more um, 
taking advantage of vulnerable kids, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of, we'll talk about vulnerabilities as well uh, okay. as we have time, um, who, who, yeah, are being taken advantage of right in their homes or neighborhoods or somebody else's home. Okay, we have a caller. Good morning, caller. Uh, good morning, Doc, and good morning, Karen and Kaylee. This is, <coughs> excuse me, Linda Spaulding. I don't want to uh, hold up your, your presentation. It's excellent. And thank you for everything that you do. And uh, what a horrific crime to commit against mm -hmm. our, our, our young people. But um, thank you for coming mm -hmm. in. I'm going to be listening to your show. Um, I just wanted to tell everybody to stay warm. Okay, super. And I, I suspect it's pretty cold where you are right now, Linda, right? Oh, you know what? I know why people go somewhere else at this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I always say, I don't mind the cold. I just don't like being cold. Yeah. <laughs> My dogs detest it, too. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. continue on with your show. Thanks, Linda. Have a great weekend. All right, thank you for calling. Bye-bye. Right. Okay, bye. Okay, so, what, so if I hear you right, things are happening more locally, in-house. <sighs> Root causes? Well, um, Things that make kids vulnerable uh, are certainly poverty, um, children who don't have what other kids have and can be lured in um, to doing things f for a cell phone or the latest sneakers or, uh, you know, pedicure, manicure, whatever. Um, certainly substance abuse issues that put parents into situations where they care nothing, you know, their, the biggest concern is where they're going to get their drugs next and being willing to either either are not attentive to the needs of their children and what's happening with their kids or actually willing to let something be done to their child in exchange for drugs or a place to stay or things like that. Um, actually, simply being an adolescent these days is a risk factor because, um, you know, I've learned some things about brain development and doing this work that the uh, prefrontal cortex where our executive functioning uh, skills are are developed uh, that doesn't really develop until probably into their 20s I'm not a 26 26 <laughs> there's there, it's so, called uh, I always killed this word amygdala or amygdala amygdala that's, yeah. that's the word yeah. that <laughs> that's controls your part. emotional You're center right. of yes. your brain and so that's highly developed in adolescence so all that to say is kids don't always see the consequences of their actions or or uh, understand the risk of their actions. So, uh, and now the internet is a huge, um, pr presents a huge um, avenue for traffickers to connect with kids. It's the new throughway. Absolutely, it, it, that's, there, great. that's a great, great way to put it, yeah. Great. It, we call it the information highway, but sadly it's also the oh. I I recruiting highway. So, so those are some of the um, vulnerabilities that kids have. Kids who have been sexually abused are more likely to also then be sexually exploited and part of that is um, when a child is sexually abused they can begin to they have a different they may have a different understanding of their body of relationships of sex you know all of those things get distorted potentially um, because um, of that abuse so if they if that abuse if they don't get support for that abuse, if they've never disclosed it, that puts them at higher risk. And so again, that's why working at the Child Advocacy Program, where that's, those, that's the population we work with, um, is kind of a natural fit with the Safe Harbor Program. So yes, this shows vulnerabilities that many kids experience. So certainly even kids who maybe are in great homes um, can be at risk if, you know, maybe they don't feel connected socially, um, Adolescents wanting more independence, making those decisions. Uh, maybe parents are doing everything they can to protect their children, but as kids, you know, get the rebellion thing, uh, they can again end up in situations because of those uh, aspects of adolescence that put them at risk for being exploited. We all have done goofy things when we were mm -hmm. kids, but this is taking it to the next level yeah. and it's yeah. getting sucked down the rabbit hole mm -hmm. the, the way I always put things yeah. what's the I don't want to I don't want to make this too simple but is there an age span that mm -hmm. seems to be the age group of mm -hmm. vulnerability yep 
So worldwide, it's estimated that youth tend to entering, enter the world of trafficking between the ages of 12 and 14. Um, the youth that we've worked with in Chautauqua County, um, we can get into those statistics a little bit more in a moment, um, the average age upon first referral to our program is 13.67 years old. So it's right in the right smack dab in the middle of there. And maybe we should talk about h how kids get referred and for what things. One of the things that the Safe Harbor Program does um, is to uh, educate community providers, those people who work with youth, on red flags for tra trafficking or exploitation. Um, and so there are a number of agencies who have a rapid screening tool that they use, and if a child flags on any of those 11 items or whatever they are, they complete a more comprehensive screening tool and they contact us and say, here's, here's what's going on with this child's life. Sometimes they flag kids who are not necessarily being trafficked yet, but that flags for risk of trafficking. And so those that's where that 13.6 age, yes. so we get statistics, and Kaylee can give you the totals in a minute, but those, those kids who are referred may not yet be being trafficked, but they certainly have risk factors that, help, that alert us to the fact that maybe we need some interventions there and to get somebody connected with them yeah. to prevent that. So when we say 13.6, yeah, yep. yeah. that's the average age that we're getting those red flags. Okay, so this is a really important question, and then we'll get to your statistics whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. People watching right now, people listening right now, and, and I know this is a tough question, but are there like five indicators that should at least pique mm. grandparents, Absolutely. parents, aunts, uncles, neighbors? These are the things that if you see some of these things, you need mm -hmm. to say something. Sure. So one of the biggest things to watch out for is a youth that's constantly um, running away or being absent without leave. So if you, if there's a youth in your life that's going somewhere and you don't know where they are and they're gone for a day or two or they come back and their situation doesn't add up, that could be a huge red flag that there's some kind of exploitation going on. So it's like some lying in there too. Some, like, yeah, like the, 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 the story I'm doesn't fit together. I'm just with a friend, you know, and well, sure. then you find out, no, you weren't with a friend. Right, and oftentimes, you know, kids are in a situation where to protect themselves, they have to, you know, cover it up that way or whatnot. So it's important to kind of dig a little deeper. Um, okay. Evidence of like, or, or I was gonna say unexplained um, change in lifestyle. So like Karen was saying, you know, kids that are, you know, exploiters know the vulnerabilities and voids that kids have. So they know that kids are looking for the newest cell phone, the newest sneakers. They wanna have, you know, their hair done, their nails done, these things. So noticing kids, that maybe don't have the financial means to afford necessarily the material goods that they all of a sudden have. Where did that come from? How did they, how did they get that? That's something to be aware of. Um, you know, if somebody's in a controlling relationship, um, especially with an older partner, or there's indications or concerns of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, that can be an indication um, of potential trafficking. Yeah, you know, controlling in my mind is like, uh I can't go out to. I can't go out with anyone else, and you know you're 13 years old. What are you mm -hmm. talking about, or yeah. whatever, yeah. or you know I, 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 yeah, or if they call, I, look, I gotta get the phone right away, or you know, and people don't realize how controlling somebody can be in these kids because they they get <coughs> they are so into that person and they feel so important right. that they have to report into that person. Right. You mentioned speaking with Diana Butcher and mm -hmm. having programs on domestic violence. It's very interesting that the the dynamics of domestic violence are very similar to the dynamics of kids who are caught in trafficking. So your two programs kind of work together, right? We do. Oh, yeah. we absolutely do. We work very much, very closely together. And Diana's mm -hmm. program also, they serve adults who have been um, trafficked and while well, we serve kids. So we are constantly, um, you know, working together, sharing cases and, and whatnot. Um, so another thing to watch out for is tattoos. Um, we see Ooh. tattoos or brandings. It's, it's not uncommon for traffickers or exploiters to brand their, their victims. Um, and we might see, we've seen dollar signs, crowns, barcodes, like that you scan in a grocery store, that kind of thing, really implying ownership. Um, I have, this is new to me. I have seen, never heard this. We've seen tattoos of people's names or of symbols representing people's nicknames, um, which has um, helped professionals in our community be able to identify kids that are being trafficked or, again, at risk for trafficking. Holy mackerel. This is like cattle being mm -hmm. branded. Mm -hmm. Now, well, and, 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 I'm, and I'm, Kaylee mentioned it's a commodification of human life, so. Uh, I may be way off base, but the, the, there's a term called tramp stamp. Is, mm -hmm. Are we on the same 
Or is that I just? I think that's just, just a, a different term. We, the, for the tattoos that we're thinking of more so, we tend to see in a very visible spot. So maybe on someone's hands, their chest, neck, face. Um, so it's very clear to um, perhaps somebody else in that trafficking world that they belong to this pimp. Oof. Okay, I asked for you to come on the show, didn't I? <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. It's, it's hard. It's hard stuff to understand. I think it's hard to understand how kids can get into those situations. So, you know, imagine if you were a, a child who, um, for some reason, felt, which again, many adolescents do, felt less than, felt mm -hmm. like nobody really cares about you. Um, you spend time wandering the streets just because maybe your home life isn't the greatest. Um, and you're out wandering and somebody starts talking to you and, and mentions how pretty you are or, hey, you look like a great kid and they, um, they fill those gaps that you may have in your life. You're lonely, you don't feel good about yourself. Um, and it might happen walking the street or it might happen on a you know, social media app. Yeah, where that's called grooming, isn't it? Yeah, Absolutely. it's called grooming, just like we see in sexual abuse cases. So it's that person developing a relationship, developing trust with this kid, knowing the things to say so that child feels understood, feels cared for, and, and, and that's the way they get sucked in quite often. And then held in those situations in a lot of different ways. They could be threatened, they could be um, caused to feel like they're in a romantic relationship, right. treated as if they're older and more mature, which, right. you know, what adolescent doesn't like that. Um, you know, if you don't do this for me, I don't know where we're gonna get, you know, so poor me kind of a thing from the trafficker's perspective. Or if you don't continue doing this, um, I know where you live, I know your family. I'll you know, tell the take, world all about you. Yeah. I'll share um, those pictures with the world. Yep, yep. Or um, we've had cases where they get kids addicted to drugs and then the kids are dependent on them for their drugs. And so um, it, I know it's hard to understand how a child could wind up in those situations, but when you put yourself, again, for those of us who didn't grow up with the internet, for one thing, um, for people who grew up in homes where you felt like you had everything you needed and, and people cared for you and you were loved. And they were and watching out for you. Yes, the and the neighbors were, yeah, it's, it's a different world now yeah. and it, it is hard to understand, but I think if we can put ourselves into the shoes of those kids, it, it again, it's still tough to fathom, but it um, mm -hmm. maybe helps us you know, be a little more compassionate or understanding and figure out how we can step in and do okay. something about it. And I, I, I want to be sure we get to that we'll before that we finish second. up. Yeah. I, I, I want to get to the, the statistics. Um, have you seen an uptick because of the pandemic? Yeah, I would say, well, like looking at, it was, it's interesting because, can I give you kind of the, how this has progressed as far as, as this? So the program started in 2016 here in Chautauqua County. And, and I should preface this that at some point, every single county in New York is doing some kind of CSEC slash safe harbor program. Um, all, you know, the state um, distributes that money and each county determines how they want to use that. So it looks different in every, in every county. But in Chautauqua County, we started this program in 2016. And in, in, in the first year, we had one referral to the program. In 2017, we had eight, and it slowly kind of ticked up from there. In 2019, we had 48 referrals. Then 2020 came, and I had expected with kids not in school for most of the year that without the teachers there and without that extra Structure, oversight that yeah. we wouldn't know about these things going on but that was actually not not true in fact we had 61 referrals in 2020 and we were you know there's a lot more telehealth going on which was really interesting so we were getting a lot more referrals from mental health providers and physicians that were seeing kids mm -hmm. um, on video chatting which was great it was a huge um, a door for us to into another part of this population um, and then, you know, this past year, we had 41 referrals, so not quite as many. It, it kind of varies, sure. but I think, um, I do think that with the pandemic, what we have seen is more of those online, um, the ac online exploitation or the online grooming, mm -hmm. where that starts in these situations. Um, so since 2016 in Chautauqua County, we've identified 172 youth to be at a high risk for trafficking. 35 of those kids have met that federal definition of trafficking and, and by their own disclosure, they've engaged in commercial sex or they're a victim of commercial sex. Um, the prevalence, the true prevalence of human trafficking is really difficult to know. Um, it's very underreported crime. A lot of people don't understand that they're being victimized because we have this idea that you know, prostitution is illegal. 
But as I read you that federal definition earlier, if you're under the age of 18, you can't consent to commercial sex, so you are therefore being victimized. But worldwide, the US Department of Homeland Security estimates there are about just shy of 25 million victims globally. Ooh. In the US in 2019, um, this is the most up-to-date data we have here from the National Human Trafficking Hotline, there was o uh, just over 22,000 victims identified in the US. In New York in 2020, 1,765 kids were identified as trafficked or at risk, with 255 of those youth meeting the federal definition. Um, oh New York, it's, it's really great that we're able to keep this data now, so we are, you know, mm -hmm. we're becoming more aware of this issue. Um, but it's yes yeah, okay there. we're down to three and a half minutes I need to know about intervention yep. I need phone numbers I need yep. people what do you got to do Karen <laughs> take it away okay well we talked about risk factors and vulnerabilities I, I um, took a training called closing the gaps and it's really to, to share with parents on how do we uh, recognize what those vulnerabilities are and how can we as parents as other relatives as just concerned adults scout leaders or anybody working with kids teachers how do we fill those gaps so that traffickers don't have gaps to work with and so first of all being a caring adult um, paying attention to children and especially you know older elementary middle school young high school age um, engaging with them in healthy ways so that they know what healthy relationships are. Um, it often is said that it only takes one caring adult to change the course of a child's life. So we really um, invite and encourage caring adults to get involved with children and youth. Um, even when they act like they don't care or they act like punks or... <laughs> or They'll circle back to you. Yeah, yep. they, they will, will. They will. And the two things that I learned about the first trafficking uh, or human... Yeah, trafficking training I went to is um, we have to get more com as service providers we have to get more comfortable with risk mm -hmm. we can't necessarily put these kids away and protect them because they'll get back out um, but within that if we build relationships with kids and I've seen this myself they may not want help right now but if I'm consistent and I'm always there uh, when they reach out um, when they need help they know where they can turn so um, and any adult can do that certainly some have more access to youth than others. So engaging with youth in healthy, healthy ways, filling those gaps, um, learning about this. And we offer, part of the reason we've seen those numbers increase, I think, is the amount of education Absolutely. we've been doing in the community. Yeah, that happens yeah. with everything. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, we have trainings. And the easiest thing to do would just be to say, call the Child Advocacy yep. Program at 716-338-9844. If you don't remember our names, um, just know that you can call and say, hey, I want more. In uh, we have a different number on there because that's the mm -hmm. actual uh, safe harbor number, but 338-9844 is our general office. If you just say, we're looking for training on human trafficking. Um, and where are you located? We have offices in Jamestown and Dunkirk. Where is James Jamestown? Jamestown is 405 uh, West 3rd Street. 405? Yep, I think that sounds right. <laughs> yes. And 425 Main Street in Dunkirk. So I uh, get those. Uh, yep, I get you. So we have offices both places. Kaylee works more often in the Dunkirk office. She goes back and forth. I'm Are police in involved? In Jamestown. Yes, we work very closely with law enforcement of all the local jurisdictions here in Chautauqua County, the sheriffs and the state police, as well as our federal partners. Okay. We have mm -hmm. less than a minute left. So uh, Kaylee, why don't you wrap things up for us? What do you want people to know? Um, I want people to know that the Child Advocacy Program is here. If you have concerns about a youth in your life that is being trafficked or at risk, please reach out to us. Um, if you are interested in learning more, also reach out to us. If you have you know, resources to invest in this issue, we are always, always, always looking for, to be frank, more funding for our program. Um, we like to help fill those gaps and meet those needs for kids in a healthy way. So whatever we can do to provide that for them, whether that be therapeutic horseback riding lessons or karate for self-defense to feel safe. You know, whatever we can do to get these kids real um, normal experiences to help them grow and learn that this is not the world that they have to live in. Okay. Ladies, thanks for coming by and talking about this very difficult topic, but something we got to keep our kids safe. Kaylee Fazier and Karen Reversky from the uh, Safe Harbor Pro Program here in Chautauqua County have been my guest. The number, if you, again, is 338-9844. Did I get that right? Got it. And uh, don't be shy. Say, uh, let's protect our kids and make sure that they're having a wholesome, safe environment to grow up in, and they will do the same with their children. 
and their children and their children. Mm -hmm. Legacy stuff. Yeah. Folks, we're going to do this again all next week. Have a safe, warm mm -hmm. weekend, and uh, thanks for watching. Take care now. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you.